Will you pray with me? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come humbly before you. And Father, we rejoice in your powerful name. Father, we can sense your spirit here. We can sense your presence. And we thank you that you have brought us here for such a time as this. Father, may we have ears to hear and eyes to see. May you be clear in what you want to say today. May this day be for you and for you only. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying with me. So when I was in second grade, uh, we had our first Lincoln Elementary track meet. And for two years, I had watched this track meet, and I was super excited for it. Okay, so those who know me or know my past, I'm a tad bit competitive. Sports, things that have competitions, that gets me going. Okay, so I woke up that morning in second grade, and I I remember this as plain as day. And I had my Wheaties, because, you know, back in those days, Wheaties was the Brexit champions. I'm pretty sure Michael was on the cover of that thing, or Carl Lewis, since, you know, it's track and field day. And I ate my Wheaties, and uh, I got up, and I had special shoes for the day. I had laid out my clothes the day before, and there were four events. There was the high jump, the 50-yard dash, the yarn ball throw, and the uh, standing long jump. And I was, I was super pumped, so I, you know, I go to my event, and the first thing was the high jump. And unfortunately, uh, I hit the bar really early, so I was out. I go over to my standing long jump, and uh, I jumped, and I slipped, and I didn't have a very good jump. And then I went to uh, the 50-yard dash, and I ran well, but not as well as I thought I should have. And lastly, I went to the yarn ball throw, and frankly, who ever invented the yarn ball throw? I mean... The you throw it and the wind matters more than your arm strength. So I, I lost. And so at the end of the day, in my first competitive thing, because back then we didn't start our three-year-olds in competitive soccer or basketball, and that was the first thing that I ever did, I had one second place. And I was crushed. I, mean, I, I, I remember crying, and it sounds silly, but for me this was a big deal. Second grade me, this was my time to show what I could do. And so the next year rolled around, third grade, and this time I took responsibility for what was to come. And no joke, no kidding, for the first month before the track meet, I would get on my bike and I'd pedal to Lincoln School. And I would go there and I would go run laps at the track to go practice the event that I was going to do. And then there was, and I don't know if you remember this, but at the end of that, um, that, that grass area, there was these bells, this blue and white bell and it had poles you could climb up. And I would climb up these poles, and I'd ring the bell. And I'd do that constantly to work my upper body strength. And then I would go practice long jump. And I would do sit-ups and push-ups. And I did this for a month ahead of time because I wasn't going to have happen what happened the year before. And then the, the day of the event came, and I got up, and, and I felt really prepared for that day. And by the grace of God, I, I went out and I competed, and I competed really well. And I walked away that day with three first place, a third place, and two school records. And what God taught me that in that early age at third grade was that it was my responsibility to take what he had given me. So there was no difference between my second grade self and my third grade self as far as what was the abilities inside of me. The difference was that I had prepared myself and put, taken responsibility to see through it. So when the day came for me to step forward, I could do it, and I could do it well. And so as Paul is going to teach us today, This is where he's going to go with this passage. So if you can, pull up the screen with the passage up there, Titus. Philippians 2 is where we're at. And so for those that don't know, uh, my name is Tim Brand. I am a former deacon here, a lifelong member of Third Church. I'm also the executive director of Many Hands for Haiti. And uh, we've been talking about Philippians. And today's topic is on the joy of responsibility. Now, when I say joy of responsibility, I think a lot of you probably think, That's a bit of an oxymoron, right? Joy, responsibility. Joy, responsibility. You know, I think, when I think back to responsibility, it's a lot like when I was a kid, you know, and you beg your mom and dad for a puppy. And you want to get that puppy. And all of a sudden, you know, that puppy comes, and you're really excited about the puppy, but you don't realize you have to feed it, and you have to go take care of it, and you got to, you know, go go to the back and scoop up what the puppy does in the backyard. 
and you get that frowny face dad who's like, we got this for you. You're going to take responsibility for it, right? That's what we think of responsibility is that frowny face, father or mother, that's, that's basically, you got to take responsibility for yourself. And so we, we, we think these words of responsibility is this burden, this yoke, this something that's put on our shoulders that weighs us down. And that's not what the passage says. So we're going to go through this today. So if you could turn with me to Philippians 2, 12 through 16 is our passage today. In your uh, Bible, if you got one back there, it's uh, 1162. So I'm just going to read this out loud. Therefore, my dear friends, have you, has, have you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaint or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe, as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So, as we look at this, a couple things jump out to me. We're going to really key on verses 12 and 13. And I don't know if you caught this or not, but it says in verse 12, at the end of that, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I don't know about you, but this all of a sudden jumped out at me. Because I, if I remember right, in my Bible teaching, salvation is not anything we earn. It is by grace in faith alone that you have salvation, but yet Paul says something here about working out your salvation. But I think what we need to do here is we need to, to switch the words. For Paul didn't say working out for your salvation. Paul says work out your own salvation. So what this means is that there's a phrase that we must work out, and that means the working in you for full completion. See, back when Paul wrote this, there was miners that were mining. And the words that he chose and the words and phrase that he said is that they were working something out to harvest something from the earth that was already put there. So the creator of the earth had already put this in place, and the miners were to work it out. They were to go and harvest this out of what God had already done. For you see, it is by grace alone and faith alone that it is salvation. We are not talking about salvation here, okay? Paul is not alluding to salvation. What Paul is alluding to is what comes after salvation. So if you can look with me at Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, and I'll put it up on the board for you. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Right there, that puts that to bed. We are not talking about salvation. Okay, This is not about salvation. Salvation is by grace and faith alone. But it says, for we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, for it is that God is the responsible of salvation, and we by grace and faith do that. But once that comes, good works come right beside it. And good works come from what's already God's put inside of you. Okay? So Paul is saying, you have been given great resources. Now go out and realize the full potential of all that you have in Christ Jesus. Now perhaps you've noticed today that there's a movement away from personal discipline and individual responsibility in the Christian walk. And I'm going to put a quote up on the board by Jerry Bridges. And so Jerry is a writer for, the, for Navigators, and Navigators is the great worldwide Christian mission. And here's what he says. We Christians may be very disciplined and industrious in our business, our studies, our home, or even our ministry, but we tend to be lazy when it comes to exercising our own, per, our own spiritual lives. We would much rather pray, Lord, make me godly, and expect him to pour some godliness into our souls in some mysterious way. But God, in fact, is a myst- God does, in fact, work in mysterious ways to make us godly, but he does not do this apart from the fulfillment of, of your own personal responsibility. We are to train ourselves to be godly. 
I don't know about you, but that struck a chord with me. How many times do I say, God, I want to be godly, but then nothing happens beyond that? I just expect this magical thing to come, and all of a sudden, I'm godly. That's not the way God works. That's not the way the Spirit works. And if you shift to verse 13, he he even delves in this further. What he says is there, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his purpose. So what Paul is saying here, and he shifts the conversation back to the purpose of this work of salvation which is that God is already working you as a Christian. We are to work because God has already worked for us. We are to respond to what God has already done. What has already been given to you has already occurred, and we then are to respond out of that to work out which God has already put inside of us. Okay? So that's a little bit confusing, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a word picture up here, and I'd like to invite my two lovely assistants over here to bring out uh, a a prop that I want to talk about. Because for me, this kind of makes sense, but not 100% makes sense. I mean, these are some deep words. And Paul, if you've ever followed Paul's writings, I mean, he he can go to some pretty deep things. But I'm going to show this in a different way. And so what they're going to be bringing out here is uh, is a boat. And what I really wanted today was, you know, a rowboat, one of those nice wooden ones that, you know, you have in the movies where there's the guy sitting there and he's, he's stroking the boat and there's the girl up there with grapes eating it in the front of the boat, just laying there. And that, so for those that you can picture that boat or creative in mind, this is that boat, okay? This is a nice wooden boat right here and, and that's what we're going to be getting into. Um, but for those that can't and don't have creativity, well, you got, a, you got an inflatable raft, okay? So we're going to make it work though. So this boat represents our lives, okay? And God gives us this boat. We don't get to choose our boat, okay? God's already chosen this boat. He's already given it to you. And what is already in your boat, he's already planted. So in my boat, there's some things that God's already planted, and we don't get to choose. Well, there's there's love, okay? God's put love in my boat, and sometimes it's more and sometimes it's less, there's purpose. God's planted purpose in my life, and, and that's in my boat. That's something God's planted with me is purpose. Uh, leadership would be another one. You know, God's given me the gift of leadership and the talent to do that, and, and that's in my boat. Eat a whole can of Pringles in one sitting. I do have that talent as well. Um, Pringles, I, I, maybe that should be lack of willpower. Okay, that should probably be lack of willpower, not eat a whole can of Pringles in one sitting although I can do that. They were right when they said, once you pop, you can't stop. That's very true. So this boat, God has given you your boat. And every boat's different, and that's fine. Our boats are not the same. God does not give us all the same things in our boat, and that's perfectly fine. But the question is, is when I get into my boat, when I start living my life, number one, how am I going to live? Okay, now there's a majority of us that we want to live life like this. This is the front, oh, there goes my oar. The front of the boat is up here, and I want to sit down in my boat and start living my life, and I want to be the one in charge. I want to be the one that sees where I want to go. I want to be the one that steers my course. I want to be the one that chooses how my gifts and talents are going to be used. I want to be the one that look here. The problem is, is when you sit like this, you can't steer very well. You can't, stro- and you, you try to stroke to go forward, and what happens? You actually end up going backwards. You actually turn in circles. You actually end up causing a major mess because you're not going the way that God intended this to be. This boat is not made for you to be the one in charge of your life, okay? And what happens, and this is salvation, is you start life living this way, okay? About me, about my stuff, about my responsibilities, about my talents, about my gifts, And in faith and in Christ Jesus, we give our lives to Jesus and we do this. We turn around in our boat and we say, Jesus, you got it all. You're going to be my steer. You're going to be my eyes. You're going to be the one that tells me where to go. These gifts and talents are not for my benefit. These are for your benefit. And I'm going to go. This is salvation. From here 
to here. Okay? So that's not in question. Salvation happened. Here's what we're going to talk about today, and here's what I'm hitting on today. You can give your life to Jesus. You can be saved. But you know what? You're not rowing the boat. You've got all the gifts and talents in the world, and you're sitting here. And what happens when you don't row your boat? What happens when you're not using your gifts and talents? What happens when you're not actually following what Jesus happens? You sit here and you drift. And you're saved. You live by faith, but you're not going anywhere. Jesus is sitting right here saying, stroke, stroke, stroke. And you're like, God, when are you going to come? When are you going to give me some purpose here, God? I've given my life to you. Where are you? And he's sitting there, Tim, you got to row the boat. you got to use your gifts and talents. Because when you start to row, you start to move. And when you start to move, you start going where Jesus wants you to go. He can't move someone that's sitting still. And as you move throughout life, there's things that are going to go by you that you're going to look and say, oh, I understand that now. I didn't get it when I was sitting here. When I was going through these hard times, when I was going through this thing that was terrible, when I was, you know, I didn't know why, like, I feel like I'm, I don't have any purpose. But then you look back in your life as Jesus leads you, and you say, oh, if I would have never gone through that, this blessing that was to come, I would have never been ready for that. If I wouldn't have in second grade had a terrible track me, I probably wouldn't have as good as a track me in third grade. Okay? This is what God's asking you to do. And this is what Paul's talking about in this passage, is we have to row our boats. Because the problem is, if we've, if, let's say you row your boat, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm good. I've rowed for a while. And then all of a sudden you start doing this again. What happens? You start drifting. And not only do you drift, you drift into other people. Okay? Because in, as Paul talked about last week, there's unity in the body. And if Jesus is the one at the front of the boat, and he's telling everyone to row and stroke in direction, we have unity in the body. And the problem is, is once somebody decides to stop doing that, they start not knocking everybody else off course. And then you and we as the body all experience pain. Because we're not living as God called us to. We're not the ones that are following what God has asked us to do. And so that is what God is talking about. Now, my question for you, what hangs in the balance if you don't do this? What hangs in the balance if you don't live your godly gifts in a Christian life? Because here's the thing about responsibility. We don't get to choose it. It comes anyway. The question is, is are we going to choose joy and faithfully fulfill what God has asked us to? Or are we going to choose regret? I've never met somebody who chose selfishly and that doesn't have regret in that decision. There's been times in my life where I knew what the responsibility was to come, but I wanted to live in the moment. And I wanted to live in that happiness that, you know, I thought would bring happiness. And you look back on it, and there's just regret. And regret's a boat anchor. Regret makes your boat not go very fast. And so when you choose joy of the responsibility to live as God has called you to, with the gifts and talent that he has given you, he will do incredibly more than you've ever asked, than you ever imagined, than you've ever thought, than you ever think. But you've got to take the responsibility to start stroking and rowing your boat. You have a unique fingerprint that God has made on you and for you alone. There's not anyone else in the world like you. God has given you unique things in your life for you to go and bear that to the world. Because, you know, it says later in that verse, in verse 15 and 16, is that you must shine like the stars in the universe. And you don't want to run a race that doesn't have purpose. And here's the thing, is when you are in your boat, 
you've given your life to Christ, you let God be at the front telling you where to go, and you start rowing out of your gifts and talents, there's going to be incredible joy, and you are going to be a light among the nations whether you choose to or not, because there's no choice. You will shine because of what shine, he's put this light inside of you, and that light's going to come out. And you're going to come to the end of your race, and you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you allowed me to run that race. Thank you for allowing, there's no trying. I mean, that's one thing that happens a lot of times. I think we look at responsibility sometimes, and we look at others like, well, if they're called to that, then I must be called to that. Right? And we try to take our gifts and talents that God's uniquely given us purpose and say, oh, I should go do that. And then we have to try so hard. When you're in Christ Jesus and you're living the life that he's called for you and you're in your gifts and talents, there's no trying anymore. You just are because Christ is the one working through you. Christ is the one that gives you the gifts. Christ is the one that is is fulfilling you to fulfillment. He's, He's making you full. It's an amazing thing. It really, really is amazing to see God do that. And so as, as we wrap up, there's a couple action items that I want to I lay on your hearts. Number one is for some of you, you're still dealing with this regret, okay? You've lived a certain way. You've done a certain thing. You've, you've been there, but you've got this regret. Now, that might be from your own regret or regret of someone else that's done something to you. And their boat got out of line, and it whacked your boat. And all of a sudden, you're off course. But the thing about regret is, number one, it only weighs you down, and it is not of Christ Jesus. Regret is not of Christ Jesus. And so for some of you today, you need to cut off the boat anchor of regret. You need to start walking towards Christ, because there's only one way to come back into fulfillment of Christ, and that's one step at a time. There's no magic answer. There's no big, like, do this, do that, do that. It's just one faithful step at a time, one faithful step at a time, one faithful step at a time, and God will see you through to completion. Number two is for some of you, you need to turn around in your boat. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you don't know that he's the Savior of your Lord, or he's your Lord and Savior. Maybe you know that there's this guy up here, but you're not sure you want to really trust him. But for some of you today, you need to give that up, and you need to say, God, your ways are better than my ways 100% of the time. I trust you in faith. I give my life to you. For some of you, you need to start rowing. You know, you've, you've given your life to Christ, and you're sitting there, and you're like, I'm a Christian, but nothing's happening. What am I doing? I don't see any purpose. I don't see, and you need to start rowing your boat. You need to look at your gifts and talents. You need to look at what God's planning. You. you need to look at your story. God's given you all unique stories that are to tell, to tell of his glory. Start living that life. And for some of you, you just need to keep, you need to keep rowing that boat. Okay, you've been rowing it. And you're like, man, I don't get this. I'm rowing. I don't see anything. I don't understand. I feel like I'm being faithful. The thing is, is God's preparing you for something in the future. Think about Joseph. Okay? Joseph knew the vision and the anointing when he was at a very young age. But Joseph had an ego problem. Okay? He went and announced to all of nine of his brothers, or whatever how many they were, hey, someday you're going to bow down in front of me, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm the man. He needed to be polished. He needed to be knocked down. There's some things that need to be taken out of him. And through a series of events that we all know with Joseph, God worked in him. And at some day, he did stand in front of his brothers, but at that point, it wasn't a boastfulness. My guess is Joseph had an overwhelming sense of purpose, okay? If it would have been 18-year-old Joseph, it would have been, look what I did. But when, when the time finally came, God had worked in his life so much, and God had knocked off so much, it wasn't a matter of, look at me. It was, look at what God has done in the position that he put me in to allow this responsibility to oversee a country and to take care of my family. And I am so thankful for God to walk me through this. Incredible. But you got to keep going. you got to keep rowing. 
And so through prayer, I think it's the best thing. So at the end of the service, there's going to be people to pray over here. There's also the place, the place of prayer. I encourage you to go up and pray. The first thing you need to do is lay it down in front of God. Just lay it down. I can't care anymore. You can't carry your responsibility yourself. Only one person can carry that to you. Some of you, you need communion. You need forgiveness. You need to let go of that regret. You need to let go of the things that have, have come and derailed you on that journey. So take those opportunities to do that. So worship team, come up. I'm going to close with the story of what this looks like in action. Um, so for those that know, I, I go to Haiti quite frequently. Um, and it was a week ago, um, it was a week ago last week that I was actually in Haiti. And God just puts amazing things in your way. And I'm leading this church out of, out of Michigan. And on the Sunday two weeks ago, we go to a, um, a community, and we go give rice distribution. So we go to families and try to encourage them with rice. And so um, this community in particular, this is the first time it's ever happened, but there was a murder in the community. Okay, so someone had died, and there was a murder in the community. And so we started off with going to two of the families, the mother and the wife of the accused, the person who murdered them, and they think they're falsely accused, Actually, the family that had the, the person that was murdered doesn't think this person did it either, but the, but the authorities arrested this person, and we prayed and we walked with that family. Then we went right from there, we went to the actual families that were affected by the murder. So we stood with the mother of the son that was killed. We stood with the um, wife and the kids of those that were killed. And this is the last one we went to, and this was the wife and the family of the guy that was murdered. And I don't know if you can see behind there very well, but that home is garbage. It is absolute garbage. It is made out of sticks and mud with a thatch roof. And when I showed up, and the door doesn't even, the door doesn't even close. The door is laying on the floor because they can't even secure their own home. Okay, and the, the whole thing is they haven't, they, they've been trying to buy this ground for $125. They can't come up with $125 to finish off their house. And I show up, and I am angry with God. I am angry, really angry. Because I'm like, this family just lost everything. Their husband got murdered. They live in this crap home. Go to the next slide. This is where they sleep. It's literally garbage. Those are sacks of cement and garbage. But that's what those kids are sleeping on. And I'm mad. I mean, I'm honking mad. And I'm like, God, why would you do this? I mean, why would you bring this? I, I don't understand. And so I struggled. I mean, I was at that. There's a picture of me, like, in front of the family, and I'm, I'm not happy. Um, and God broke my heart. And it's like, God, that's just not right. And so that night, um, we're praying through it as a group. And uh, one of our 16-year-old girls in the group, who has the gift of writing, took it upon her responsibility to write a blog that night. And so she wrote a blog about what she just saw in this situation. And so she took her gifts and talent, she put it on a blog. And then from there, there was a man from Sioux City, Iowa, that had the gift of affluence. He has a lot of money, and he had been to Haiti a couple weeks before, and God broke his heart for what he saw. And he read this blog, and he said, this is my responsibility. I'm going to build a new house. And he did. He wrote a check on that spot. So a week ago, was I was standing there. This is a week later. Go to the next picture. There's a new house being built. And I'm like, God, why did you bring us here? And God said, Tim, trust me. I put the right people in place for this to not happen. This isn't my ways. This is Satan's ways. This was not of me. This wasn't what I wanted for this family. This wasn't what I was, what I was hoping for. This is what I was hoping for. And now there's a story that's woven through this where there's people that lived in their God-giving callings as they walked in faith and they stepped out and they, they went and met people where God was already at and now a home's going to rebuild. And in that community, what do you think the conversations are now? It's that the God is good. God's in the situation. Yeah, that was bad, but look what's happening because he sent the right people. And so we all can enter that too. For me, my story is in Haiti. And, and that's, that's where God has called me. That's where I'm walking. But for all of us, God's anointed different things. He's put different things inside of you. 
but you have to work out your salvation to find out what that is. It's not enough just to say, I follow Jesus. You've got to then start doing it because when you do, he will do incredibly more than you ever imagined or ever thought.